I'm Rob Dansman, and this is The Better Semester, where I provide insight and actionable advice to parents of college students. I'm a nationally certified counselor and licensed clinical mental health counselor, specializing in work with college students and their parents to improve mental health, organization, and motivation. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Better Semester, where we delve into the complexities of college student mental health and wellness. Today, I'm talking about derealization, depersonalization, and dissociation. I'm going over what this is and what parents can do to help. It's a fascinating yet challenging aspect of mental health that can cast a surreal haze over a student's perception of reality. You may have heard your college student, friend, or colleague use terms related to feeling detached or untethered to their life at some point. Here's a super fast definition for each of the typical terms used related to feelings of disconnection. First one is depersonalization, which is where students have the feeling of being outside of themselves and observing their actions, feelings, or thoughts from a distance. Derealization is where they feel the world is unreal. People and things around them may seem lifeless or kind of foggy. Dissociation is experiencing a loss of connection between thoughts, memories, feelings, surroundings, behavior, and identity. Now, I want to move from these definitions to brain regions for just a bit to provide some structural context. You won't be tested on this material, but my goal is to reinforce to the parents and clinicians listening out there that all of the symptoms we're talking about reside in one or more parts of the brain, which theoretically means there's an opportunity for effective interventions and treatment. I think we can all agree that dissociative disorders involve disruptions in the normal integration of consciousness, or memory, and identity and perception. While the exact neurobiological mechanisms underlying dissociative disorders are not fully understood, research has suggested involvement in various and specific brain regions and neural networks. Here are some of those brain regions and networks that have been implicated or at least studied in association with dissociative disorders. For example, the hippocampus, which is a region deep inside the brain that kind of hugs the top of the brainstem. It's involved in memory formation and retrieval. Alterations in hippocampal function have been identified in individuals with dissociative disorders, particularly regarding traumatic memories. Next up is the amygdala. It's the little almond-shaped blobs at the end of the hippocampus, actually. The amygdala plays a role in processing emotions, particularly fear and threat detection. Dysregulation of the amygdala has been observed in individuals with trauma-related dissociative symptoms. Next up is the prefrontal cortex, uh, which is very the very front part of our brains right above the eyes. The prefrontal cortex is responsible for executive functions, decision-making, and self-regulation. Disruptions in prefrontal cortex activity have been linked to difficulties in emotion regulation, which is often seen in dissociative disorders. The next area is called the default mode network, or DMN. The DMN is a network of brain regions associated with self-referential thinking, mind-wandering, and autobiographical memory. Changes in the DMN connectivity have been observed in individuals with depersonalization and derealization disorders. Next is the thalamus, one of the centermost regions of the brain right above the brainstem. The thalamus acts as a relay station for sensory information. Abnormalities in thalamic function have been suggested in dissociative disorders, contributing to disruptions in sensory perception. Along with that is the hypothalamus, which is the lower part of the thalamus. The hypothalamus is involved in regulating the autonomic nervous system and stress responses. Dysregulation in hypothalamic function may contribute to heightened stress responses often seen in dissociative disorders. The corpus callosum, which hugs all of the central brain regions and connects left and right hemispheres in the brain, is the next region. The corpus callosum connects the two hemispheres of the brain and is involved in communication between them. Changes in the corpus callosum have been observed in individuals with dissociative identity disorder. It's important to emphasize that these associations are not universally applicable to 
everyone with dissociative disorders. And the exact neural mechanisms vary among different subtypes of dissociation. Additionally, environmental factors such as exposure to trauma or stress can play a significant role in the development and expression of dissociative disorders. Now, let's move towards the more clinical language and the breakdown of these different dissociative disorders and talk about symptoms. People with dissociative disorders can sometimes have a feeling of being disconnected from themselves and the world around them. Sometimes they forget about certain time periods and events and maybe even some personal information. Other times, some people feel uncertain about even who they are. Some have multiple distinct identities. They might have a feeling of little or maybe even no pain, physical pain. Some people with dissociative disorders also occasionally have seizures. In general, dissociation is a way the mind copes with too much stress. Periods of dissociation can last for a relatively short period of time, like hours or even days, or for much longer periods like weeks or months. Many people with a dissociative disorder have had a traumatic event during childhood. Dissociation can happen as a way of coping with it. Someone with a dissociative disorder may have experienced physical, sexual, or emotional abuse during childhood. Some people dissociate after experiencing war or kidnapping or even an invasive medical procedure. Switching off from reality is a normal defense mechanism that helps the person cope during a traumatic time or memory of a traumatic time. It's a form of denial, as if this is not happening to me. It becomes a problem when the environment is no longer traumatic, but the person still acts and lives as if it is and has not dealt with or processed the event. Now, I want to talk about some of the specific types of dissociative disorders. There are several different types of dissociative disorder. There are basically three main ones. The first one is depersonalization, derealization disorder. Next one is dissociative amnesia. And the third one, dissociative identity disorder. Depersonalization derealization disorder is where someone may have the feeling of being outside themselves and observing their actions, feelings, and thoughts from a distance. Derealization is where they feel the world is unreal. People and things around them may seem lifeless or foggy, like I said earlier. People can have depersonalization or derealization or even both together. It may last only a few moments or come and go over many years. When someone has depersonalization, derealization disorder, they feel detached from themselves, which is what we refer to as the depersonalization part. And they also feel disconnected from their environment, which is the derealization piece. While feelings like this may come and go for many people, in people with depersonalization, derealization disorder, they tend to last a long time or persist, or they go away and come back or are recurrent. Depersonalization affects an individual's ability to recognize their thoughts, feelings, and body as their own. It might feel like they're watching themselves play a role in a movie rather than living their life. For example, if they're grocery shopping, they might feel like they're watching someone else push the cart, select food from the shelves, and go through the checkout line. Or they may not recognize their reflection in the glass doors of the frozen section. Derealization affects an individual's ability to see their surroundings accurately. Things might not seem real, or they might feel like they're looking through a clouded window or black and white rather than full color reality. Objects might look distorted in shape or size, or they may feel like they change while they look at them. In depersonalization derealization disorder, individuals may experience depersonalization, derealization, or both but they haven't lost touch with reality. They understand that their perceptions aren't real, which can be frustrating and often cause anxiety. Psychiatrists classify depersonalization derealization disorder as a dissociative disorder in the DSM-5. Dissociative identity disorder and dissociative amnesia are also in this category. So 
How common is depersonalization and derealization disorder? Most people know what it's like to be disconnected from time to time. This is called transient depersonalization. But depersonalization, derealization disorder is long lasting. It generally happens to one to 2% of the population. Though it's more common in adolescents, young adults, and people with other mental health conditions. Next, I want to talk about dissociative amnesia. Someone with dissociative amnesia will have periods where they can't remember information about themselves or events in their past life. They may also forget a learned talent or skill. These gaps in memory are much more severe than normal forgetfulness and are not the result of another medical condition like traumatic brain injury. Some people with dissociative amnesia find themselves in a strange place without knowing how they got there. They may have traveled there on purpose or wandered in a confused state. These blank episodes may last minutes, hours, or days. In rare cases, they can last months or years. Similar to depersonalization derealization disorder, the rate of dissociative amnesia lies between 1% to 2% of the population. Next, I want to talk about dissociative identity disorder. Dissociative identity disorder used to be called multiple personality disorder. Someone diagnosed with DID may feel uncertain about their identity and who they are. They may feel the presence of other identities, each with their own names, voices, personal histories, and mannerisms. The main symptoms of DID are memory gaps about everyday events and personal information, and having several distinct identities. Dissociative identity disorder, or DID, is also very uncommon and typically affects 1.5 to 2% of the general population. Research has also found that about 95% of people accurately diagnosed with DID have a history of physical or sexual trauma. Next, I want to talk about diagnoses and tests and how we can use these to determine whether or not someone has a dissociative disorder. During a clinical intake assessment, a student's therapist or psychologist or psychiatrist will look for other mental health conditions first, also known as comorbidities, like depression or anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder. They may even look for personality disorders. If they don't have another diagnosis that more clearly fits, they're not coming off medication and their experiences aren't related to mood-altering substances like drugs or alcohol they may diagnose them with depersonalization derealization disorder or a dissociative disorder. So what tests will be done to more accurately diagnose these students? Well, if a student's provider suspects some type of dissociative disorder, they may ask a series of questions that help identify their symptoms, how often they occur, and how much they interfere with the student's well-being. They may also ask them to complete some psychological assessments, also known as batteries or tests. Although finding the right words to describe their feelings may be hard, it's important for the student to be as specific as possible about what life is like for them so the clinician can more accurately diagnose and recommend effective treatment. So what is the management and treatment for dissociative disorders? How is all this dissociative stuff treated if it's just some form of detachment from reality? Researchers still aren't sure about the best way to treat depersonalization, derealization disorders, or dissociative disorders. When considering treatment options, though, clinicians will talk with the student about their medical history and symptoms and treatment goals. They may recommend medication and maybe types of therapy like cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, or even eye movement desensitization processing or EMDR. I want to talk a little bit about medication more specifically. Although talk therapy is the most effective treatment, clinicians may recommend a medication or more accurately a combination of medications as part of their treatment, especially if the dissociative symptoms are proving to be what clinicians refer to as treatment resistant. Some of the typical categories of effective medications for dissociation include selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs, anti-anxiety medications, mood-stabilizing medications, and antipsychotic medications. 
There's updated research pointing to the use of SSRIs and antipsychotics as the most effective combination of medications to treat dissociation. Let's move away from medication and now look at prognosis. How long does depersonalization, derealization, and dissociative disorders last? Again, there's not a lot of research on what to expect if someone has dissociation or depersonalization stuff going on. Left untreated, depersonalization and derealization can last for years off and on. Sometimes it re resolves itself on its own, but it might negatively impact their relationships or work life. With treatment, people commonly start to see an improvement in their symptoms within a few months. How can students take care of themselves just on their own? If a student has lasting symptoms of depersonalization, derealization, their priority should be to seek treatment from a therapist for behavioral and psychological tools and psychiatrists for medication and medical advice as I addressed before. They'll likely need several visits weekly initially and then regular follow-ups throughout the semester with occasional follow-ups with the psychiatrist. A good psychiatrist will help find the right treatment for their specific situation and ensure that the side effects of the medication are manageable. The therapist will use talk therapy to teach skills to cope with symptoms and gain insight into their symptom triggers. In the meantime, though, the best things for students to do is to take their medication as prescribed and try to be gentle with themselves as much as possible while not ignoring daily assignments and obligations. It's okay if they can't find words to accurately describe their experience. And while it's natural to worry about one's health, encourage them not to dwell on it. Paced breathing that involves a long exhale and meditation use can calm a racing brain that just feels out of control or is too worried about feeling disconnected from their life. So I just talked about what students can do to positively impact their life and their wellness. Now let's talk about what they should not be doing and kind of more accurately, what not to eat, what not to drink, and also what not to take. If someone has depersonalization, derealization disorder, it's a good idea to avoid substance use. Drugs and alcohol can bring about symptoms of depersonalization, derealization. They may also interact with medications. It's important for students to be honest with their mental health care team about when and how they use substances. It's also not a great idea to binge on caffeine either. The relationship between caffeine and dissociative disorders isn't really well researched, and individual responses obviously can vary. But here are some considerations. Caffeine has a stimulant effect, and for some individuals, especially those with anxiety or dissociative symptoms, stimulants may exacerbate feelings of jitteriness, restlessness, or even anxiety. There's also increased arousal. Caffeine can increase arousal and alertness. In some cases, heightened arousal may be counterproductive, though, for individuals with dissociative disorders who may benefit from a calmer and more relaxed state. Caffeine also can disrupt sleep. It can interfere with sleep significantly, leading to difficulties in falling asleep or staying asleep. Quality sleep is crucial for mental health, and disruptions in sleep patterns may impact dissociative symptoms. All right, now I want to talk about what parents can do to best support their college student if they suspect they're struggling with any of these mental health challenges. First of all, get some psychological testing scheduled. As I've mentioned in previous podcasts and blog posts, psych testing is a solid starting point to establishing what's going on and what some effective interventions may look like on or around campus. Next, provide regular check-ins about their symptoms and also about practical day-to-day -day stuff. While I don't want students to ignore any of these dissociative symptoms they're experiencing, I also don't want it to be the only topic they refer to when talking to friends and family. This can lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy. Next up, don't assume that fine means fine. If you sense that something is wrong or off, say something. Promoting transparent, consistent communication about uncomfortable topics like this leads to more opportunity for change. Finally, validate feelings and thoughts, but always come back to behavior. It's the one thing we can control. 
Dissociative symptoms make us feel like we can't control a lot. Encouraging your son or daughter to identify even seemingly small things in their grasp can pull them through tough days. Okay, folks, I hope this helps you understand more about derealization, depersonalization, and dissociation in college students. That's it for this episode. For more information, check out my blog at motivatecounseling.com or my two books on Amazon. Just search for my name, Rob Dansman. 